The final aspect covered in the PCA course is how to determine outliers. And an outlier is simply a sample that's different from all the other ones. And the problem with an outlier is that it can disturb the model, so make the model irrelevant, ruin the model, or make the interpretation made from the model uh, misleading. The most common cause for an outlier is typically an error, a labeling error, it could be noise in the data, but one thing that you also have to consider is that an outlier might actually be the most interesting sample that you find, a unique sample somehow. In any case, an outlier is something that you have to deal with. You have to decide what to do if you detect an outlier. The obvious thing to do is to remove the outlier, but you should be very careful about that. If you end up removing 50% of your data, calling them outliers, well, then the model that you have only represents 50% of your data. On the other hand, if you can say that this outlier is clearly wrong because it was wrongly recorded or wrongly labeled, or something similar to that, then of course it is quite reasonable to remove it. But if you cannot detect why the outlying sample is wrong, well then maybe you have to consider resampling, getting new samples that represent the type of variation that you see in the outlying sample. Let's take an example. Here we have a univariate measurement. Three different samples they are different concentrations of some chemical analyte and we have measured the absorbance at a specific wavelength. Let's say that we have two more samples and you can see that they are in between the three original ones. Are these two samples of the same nature as the three first ones? Hmm, that's difficult to say. From a univariate measurement, we cannot really say if they are the same type. But let's say that instead of measuring just one variable, one wavelength, we measured many wavelengths. If we did so, then you can see that it's quite, quite easy to see that the top red one is different from all the other ones. So the top red one is an outlier. Those types of outliers can be detected in PCA and that means that we have a built-in quality control for our data which is important in many different settings. So we need to make that operational so that we can detect and describe outlying samples. Let's look at the example we used before. Six different persons and two different variables and we have now added two more persons or two more uh, samples. One is the upper right one and here we have what we could call the world's tallest person. You can see that the relation between the two original variables is the same for this sample as for the original six ones but the person is in a different area of the model. So that could be a sampling problem, that we need more tall persons if we want to cover that area. The other example, the lower one, well that's a sample which is not as close to the model as all the other samples are. That model has a different, uh, that sample has a different relation between the weight and the height. Those are the only two kinds of outliers we need to consider and we need to be able to detect those and we need to be able to figure out why they are positioned the way they are. Detecting outliers is quite simple. There are two things that we need to look at. And if you look at the world's tallest person, you can see that that sample would have a high score value. High meaning high relative to the six uh, normal ones. So looking at score plots and looking at extreme score values would tell us something about outliers of this type. The dinosaur or the different sample, well the way it distinguishes itself is by a high residual. So the residual of the dinosaur is much different 
from all the other residuals. And in this case, if you look at the score value of the dinosaur, you can see that that's within the score values of the six original samples. So there's nothing special about the score value in this case. Although in many cases we will see different combinations of these two types of outliers. But the two basic ways to detect outliers are through residuals and score values. If we start with the score values, then the most effective approach is simply to look at score plots. So go through all the score plots of the model. If you have a five component PCA model, look at score plots of the different components, typically scatter plots, and look at the groupings and look at score values that look special. And it's on purpose that we don't make it more quantitative than that because most information is most easily found by just looking at the score values comparing with what you expect about the data. Here's an example. Here we have a data set of nuclear magnetic resonance data. In this case there are 27 samples and each sample contained different concentrations of three different chemicals. The samples were made according to a factorial design. So we expect that this factorial design is reflected in the score plot. But if you look at sample 27 in the score plot below, you see that this is positioned in a very awkward place compared to all the other ones. The other ones seem to be reflecting this factorial design somehow, but sample 27 is clearly different. Now this is a, a good example of an outlier. There must be something different about sample 27 and by looking into the model, looking into the raw data, etc., we might be able to detect what is wrong with that samples. sample. Sometimes you want to be able to automate the detection of outliers. If you want to do outlier detection every minute, because you want to do outlier detection in a process monitoring situation, for example, you cannot do that manually. And then there are different ways of automating the detection of outliers. It's important to remember, though, that the visual interpretation of your model is normally the most powerful one. But it's good to know that there are ways to automate, uh, for example, the outlier detection. Hotelling's T-squared is often used for that. And what the Hotelling's T-squared is doing is that it tests the score values of one specific sample compared to the variation in all the remaining samples. It takes the covariance structure of your data into account, so it detects whether your sample is extreme compared to the variation in the original data. We will not go into the theory of this in detail, but it's, it's important to know uh, that this approach exists. An underlying important assumption in a Hotelling's T-squared is that your data come from a multivariate, normally distributed uh, population. So basically what you assume is that your data come from one distribution. If you look at the lower plots, you can see that if you have a sample set where you have different groupings, well then an outlier which is lying in between all the groups will not be detected by the T-squared. But looking at it visually, you could easily detect that as an outlier. Still, the Hotelling's T-squared is very efficient for automating outlier detection. Here's an example. Here we see sugar samples well, spectra of sugar samples at each line here represents a spectrum measured on one sample. And now we want to detect if there are any outliers here. Well, we can see that there are two top ones that seem extreme, but apart from that, the data actually looks a little bit boring. If we do a PCA on this data, we can plot a score plot of the data and we can add an ellipse for the Hotelling's t squared. Here you see a 95% confidence limit, and you can see that there are several samples outside, but there are three, one, three ones that are a little bit extreme compared to the other ones. Sample 7, 10, 
and 71. If we look at the raw data though, we are only able to see two of these, namely sample number 10 and sample number 71, whereas sample number 7, which seems quite extreme, does not really show up in the raw data. But we will get back to that one. Leverage is another term that's often used in relation to detecting uh, outliers uh, in terms of scores. It's closely related to Hotelling's T-squared, but it comes from a different background. It comes from regression, but it basically says the same as the Hotelling's T-squared. In many cases, we work with Euclidean distances, but if you look at the plot below and look at the green dot, the sample represented by a green circle, you can see that that sample has a Euclidean distance to the uh, middle of the model, which is smaller than some of the more extreme samples, but in a different direction. The Euclidean distance is not very useful for detecting outline samples because it doesn't take the structure of the data into account. The Mahalanobis distance, on the other hand, does take the covariance structure into account. And the ellipse shown here is the Mahalanobis distance 1 to the center of the model. And you can now see that the green sample has a much higher Mahalanobis distance to the middle of the model than some of the other more extreme samples. The leverage is simply the squared Mahalanobis distance, which is linearly related to the Hotelling's T-squared. So a high leverage simply means a sample that is unique somehow, that is positioned differently from the other ones taking the covariance structure into account. So now we saw two different ways of automating the detection of outliers using the scores. We also have to look into the residuals in order to detect if we have any outlying samples in terms of residuals. And the only thing we're looking for here is samples that have high residuals. High residuals meaning high relative to the other samples. What do we know about residuals? We know they are small, we know they are approximately random, and we know that they are often of similar size. Sometimes we know much more than that, and then we can do elaborate statistical tests. But in many situations where we do PCA, we do not know that much about the residual variation. Uh, so usually we just look at the residuals, visualize them in different ways in order to detect outlying samples. The residuals they are held in a matrix that will have the same size as our original data. Below you see the residuals from a PCA model of the six different persons and the height and weight. And you can see the residuals, the rightmost uh, matrix, and that has also six rows and two columns. What we can detect here potentially could be a single, a single element which has a high residual compared to the other ones, that would mean that one measurement for one sample was wrong somehow. Maybe the sensor didn't work, or maybe there was another problem. We could also have a situation where a whole row would have significantly higher residuals than all the other rows. That would indicate that that sample is different. Or we could have a column, a column with a high uh, residual variation, and that would indicate that that variable was different from the other ones, less well described by the PCA model. And this is exactly what we have shown here. So there are different ways to look into the residual matrix. Also, we can look at the residuals as such. We can visualize them just like we can visualize the data. But we can also use them to calculate variances or sums of squares and in that way compress them into numbers that will tell us something about their magnitude. 